we can maybe if we want to go back and we need some learning, we can yeah. go back and, and, and sort of uh, pick up where where we might have um, just need to focus on. So awesome book. <laughs> Thank I, you. I actually have both of them here. Yes, that's right. I worked on both right. of them. Yeah. I'm an experienced fan, but uh, yeah, quite interesting. I loved the first one, um, and of course, you know, the second one it came out. I had to obviously, you know, proceed with the theme. Yes. Yeah. But Gus, I mean, just for the sake of the other guys who are not here and they don't know who Gus Silver is, yeah, uh, you know, just a brief intro. Who is Gus? Is Gus Gustav? Or oh, it's short for Gustav, or <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not really short for anything. It's basically just my, just my 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 nickname over the years that I've used oh, it. Oh, short, short okay. My name, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Well, I'm basically um, uh, good to see everyone. I'm basically my background is in journalism, and I think if you work as a journalist, you know you are interested in primarily in people. And where they come from and what they do and what motivates and drives them and what stories they have to tell so for me this um uh, these stories of social entrepreneurs are particularly interesting because they're all very different but you know everyone's got something in common in that they a trying to start a business that will hopefully make a profit and b they're also trying to do something it will benefit society at large, and of course, specifically sort of African society. So the stories are all very interesting, very different backgrounds, very different people. Um, and that's what interested me as someone who was, you know, asked to um, interview them and tell their stories. Uh, I had never even heard the term social entrepreneur before working with Gibbs on these books. And, um, uh, I've come to understand what it means, but it's still a topic that a lot of people argue about. What exactly is a social entrepreneur? Um, I think to me, it's just, you know, it's essentially somebody who sees beyond the rands and sense of their business, the difference that they can make in society. And I think in our society, we, as we all know, we need entrepreneurs, but we also need social entrepreneurs. And that's why these stories for me were very interesting. Awesome. But guys, maybe maybe let me take you one or two steps before we get into social entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. I mean, you wrote a book, Electric Graffiti, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that, was, uh, that book is yeah. a <laughs> that book's basically a, comp a compilation of essays and posts on social media. So I'm very very interested in social media. Once again, social media, social entrepreneurship. It's all yeah. to do with society. So okay. that's a book. It's a compilation. It's a book of posts. Um, I use Facebook a lot, but I use it kind of quite differently. I don't simply post what's happening uh, on a sort of um, family level or anything. I specifically look at what's happening in the world around me, and they are basically thought pieces and uh, observations and so on. So a different kind of journalism, but that is a compilation of pieces from over the years. So, I mean, I saw, <laughs> as I was doing my research, I saw an interview that you did on selfie. Yes. And I was like a full interview on selfie. Wow, well, correct. That's quite yeah. interesting. So is this yeah. Well, you know, we live in really interesting times, and particularly now because of the pandemic. But we live in interesting times partly because of the internet, and uh, there's so much happening um, that is new and interesting that hasn't happened before in history. And I'm very interested in the way the internet and mobile technology and social media influences the way we work, the way we interact, the way we communicate. And uh, yeah, selfies is one element of that. You know, it used to be very unusual for people to walk around with cameras. You hardly had a, a small portion of the, of the populace would have a camera with them and certainly a very small portion would ever take a self portrait. But now that we all have phones with us, it's, it's, it's habit. We all do it all the time. It's, so that's a phenomenon that I was once again interested is this, in. Is this, is this like your type of topics that you, you, you gravitate towards, this type of peculiar? Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, so I'm very interested in technology uh, and the way it influences us. And I think it influences everything. I mean, you know, if it wasn't for technology, this pandemic would be a very different one. 
Um, it's the first pandemic in history, really the big global pandemic where we've been able to use technology to, mm. uh, you know, to communicate. It would otherwise be very diff different. Um, mm. So technology that we take for granted has suddenly become very important to us. And I think specifically also it's very important for people who work in the entrepreneurship field it would be very difficult to be an entrepreneur nowadays if you didn't have some form of mobile technology with you and yeah. uh, we live on a continent that's got more mobile phones than anywhere else on yeah. earth there are more mobile phones in africa we're the most connected continent so even even the most basic grassroots entrepreneurs working in rural industries, for example, will at some level use mobile technology. And that's why I think it's a very revolutionary uh, tool that's allowing people to do things that would have been very difficult a few years before. So yeah, all of these things for me tie up and they're all very interesting and they all have something to say about who we are as people and also who we are as, as, as Africans and South Africans. I think we have a different way of using technology. We tend to use it, um, uh, you know, very wisely and very smartly and in very more rudimentary ways often than elsewhere in the world. So all of those things, and I think there's quite a few stories in this book that are about how technology is changing entrepreneurship and society. So before, before we get into the book, I mean, let's talk about your, as an author, um, you know, uh, I mean, we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about the book, but just your writing style. I mean, you have this writings, and I was saying to Karen that there's this jazz, you know, there's this jazz about, I would read it, I would read a sentence, I'm like, whoa, yeah, there's some poetry going here. So I, so I was asking Karen, because I've worked with Karen a bit, I'm like, I don't know you to be like this. I mean, where is this jazzy type, poetry type coming from? And she was like, no, 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 no. that's gas, that's gas there. I'm like, okay, now it explains it. I mean, what's yeah. your writing style? I mean, how, you know, do you wake up one one day feeling like you're poetic and you're gonna start, you know, speaking? <laughs> yeah. How does that work? Well, yeah, well, that's a good question. Where does writing style come from? I mean, part of what I do, and I've done quite a lot over the years, is actually run workshops on aspects of writing and social media. And one thing that you try to get across to people when you're talking to them about writing is how to kind of develop a voice. So even though you're not speaking, you've got a voice as a writer. And some people's voice will be very serious. Other people's voice will be kind of very playful. For me, um, writing is actually very similar to movie making. It's very visual. So what you're trying to do as a writer, you're trying to put pictures into people's heads. So I see it as a very similar process to, um, you know, it's actually very similar to music and to movies. It's similar to music in the way that music has to have a rhythm. Writing also needs to have a rhythm. You need to kind of hear it in your head, but you also need to see. So for me, the power of writing is that it's simply words on a page. And yet, as we read, we start seeing pictures in our heads. And this is actually why we read. We read because we are visual people primarily. We see the world first and foremost. And when you read something, you start entering a state of mind where you're no longer thinking about the words, you're thinking about the pictures that you see. So that for me is what writing is all about. It's the challenge is how can you make the reader see, but also more than that, how can you make them use their other senses? So you, you try to write in a way that the reader can actually almost smell and taste and, and touch. That's what you hope to do. Of course, there's different kinds of writing. You wouldn't want to do that for every, every type of writing you're doing. But if you want to vividly tell someone's story, you would want to use the senses as much as possible. And then you kind of develop an instinct for it and you get a sense of the rhythm of writing and the pace of writing and your tone shifts from one to the other. To me, it's a very similar uh, art form, I think you can call it, to music and to, and to movies. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's evoking images in people's heads and making them see things that are way beyond what they will see on the page. So yeah, that's where it comes from. Of course, everyone who writes will develop their own style based on who they are, based on their own kind of view of the world. 
That's what makes it interesting. Everybody writes differently. You won't ever get two people who write exactly the same. That's why, you know, that's why, uh, you know, take 10 journalists and take them at an event, they'll each write a very different story. You might have one journalist who sees things that the others don't because they're more tuned to look for the small details. Um, and others may kind of be able almost to read people's minds. You know, they're so tuned to, to behavior and body language and so on. So yeah, people develop a writing style by writing. And they also develop that style by trying very hard until it becomes instinctive to tell stories in a way that makes them come to life on the page. Wow. So, so yeah. do you write do you write every day or do you have do you have like a like a routine that you know from yeah. 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. is my writing time? Or yeah. do you have a routine? Do you write or do you write yeah. as and when well, you know when you're writing for a living? You obviously have to write to some sort of schedule. You have to say, I have to write so many words today or this week or this month. But we also live in an age where more people are writing more things on more platforms than ever before in history. So um, you have writing that you write for a living. You have writing that you write for communication. And then you have writing that you write for leisure. So between Twitter and Facebook and and formal work and emails, we all actually write a lot. So there's different kinds of writing. Some, some of the writing is purely kind of social. In other words, if I'm on Twitter and I write something that's 50, 60, 70 words, Facebook is a bit longer, but then you have the formal writing that is very different and very high pressure and very specific in that you need to convey something specifically for an audience. But yeah, I think to be a writer in the 21st century means you almost never stop writing. It's not a question of, let me write from six in the morning until six at night. You're kind of constantly writing. The challenge, the big challenge for anyone who writes nowadays is to get away from the distractions of other kinds of um, media. So you try and write in a world where you don't spend too much time on Twitter or Facebook. And that's like a little bit hard to do. Uh, because it's part of your work as a writer also is to be plugged into what other people are thinking and saying. But yeah, it comes down to uh, to discipline and to getting your formal work done. Um, but yeah, I think if you're a writer these days, at some point, you're either writing or you're thinking about writing or you kind of wishing you were doing something other than writing. <laughs> Writer's block? Do you wake up? Well, and, oh. no, no, that's not yeah, that is a, a real thing, but it's more, I think in the 21st century, it's more writer's distraction than writer's block. Uh, so writer's block is often these days a case of, I need to write, but first let me have a look at Twitter. I need to write, but first let me go outside and take some pictures of the rain with my phone. There's so much else happening. Um, so it's very difficult to simply lock yourself in a room and and get ahead with your writing. Um, that is a bigger challenge. In fact, it's such a challenge that you now have programs, you have apps that physically cut off your internet access so that, you, so that you're not distracted. That's how bad it is. Um, writer's block is, you know, you hear about it a lot, but what it really is, is a problem with the basics of writing. So for instance, if you don't have a good sense of the structure of what you need to do, beginning, middle, end, etc. then you will get stuck because you won't be sure where to start. So for a lot of people, the writing process starts with a very formal structure. And once you have that structure in place, it's like, it's like building a building. You know, if you're an architect, you don't just go out and randomly start piling bricks together in the hope that you'll build something. Um, you design something as a blueprint, and then that blueprint gets uh, becomes the object uh, on which the building takes shape. It's yeah. the same thing with writing. So the block part of it is very often just a, a lack or an absence of a, a proper structure. The rest of it is like anything else. It's yeah. it's just some kind of world to go ahead and do it. Okay. Yeah. So how did you, I mean, easing into the book, Take us through, I mean, how did you write the book itself? You know, before yeah. we talk about the stories inside, but just fixing the stories together. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this book, both of these books are products of the Gordon Institute of Business Science and their social entrepreneurship modules. And um, the idea was to make the books a combination of theory and storytelling. So um, I was commissioned as a journalist to interview the chosen entrepreneurs, and they were narrowed down from you know, hundreds into um, uh, 15 or 20 or so in each book. And once they'd been decided on, it was simply a journalistic exercise, going out, interviewing people, spending time with them, finding out what their stories were, finding out what makes them think and what makes them work, and then going back and writing the stories, each story being about 3,000 words or so. And then in, the, in between, um, the Gibbs experts, uh, Karen Krecher and Dr. Karen Myers, would, would kind of explore what made these social entrepreneurs interesting and different, and crucially, what we could all learn from them. So this is a, these are very interesting books in the sense that they're combinations of textbook theory and academic analysis and journalistic style storytelling. Yeah. And because these individuals are all interesting individuals with interesting stories to tell, that for me was the interesting thing about the project. Um, you know, putting them in the spotlight, finding out what makes them work, finding out what they understand about social entrepreneurship, and then simply journalistically bringing their stories to life. So that's the process, yeah. Okay, and did you get to interview all of them yourself? Yeah. Yes. So first of all, so yeah, so the process is a bit more complex than simply me going to interview people. First of all, because these are both academic works, they um, were kind of pre-interviewed by people, especially the first book. There were a series of pre-interviews. So that provided a lot of background in which people were taken into a room, sat down in front of a video camera and were interviewed, much more for the first book. And then using that material, I was able to, to kind of see where the gaps were and to see where there were opportunities to take those stories a little bit further and give them more human interest. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was more than a, just a simple journalistic storytelling exercise. There was also a lot of, of academic style research involved. And of course, journalists, in a sense, primarily also begin as researchers. So this combination of academic research and journalistic research I think balanced this quite nicely in the book. And obviously it's working to, together very closely with Gibbs and what the intentions were with the books, hopefully trying to get that met as well. But, but what sort of, I mean, social entrepreneurship, like social entrepreneurs, I mean, except that you are somebody who's very passionate about social media, what yeah. drew you to social entrepreneurs? I mean, it's like, you know, is it exciting? Was it exciting for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, once I kind of grappled with understanding what the term means, um, and then you kind of spend a bit of time with people. And I think one thing all entrepreneurs have in common, whether they're formal business entrepreneurs, um, you know, of the kind of Jeff Bezos mold, in other words, pure kind of profit-driven entrepreneurs or whether they're social entrepreneurs, they all kind of encounter obstacles along the way, often huge obstacles. They often have to pick themselves up, start all over again, get into a different field, fail there, eventually succeed in a completely different field. So their stories are what we call, you know, in the movie business and in, and in the literature business, you have what's known as the hero's journey which is a classic way of telling a story. So if somebody goes to, to perform a task or they go on an expedition or a mission and they meet obstacles and they fail. And then they pick themselves up and they learn from these failures. And then eventually they learn lessons. And then they kind of, from these lessons, they have some sort of triumph or redemption. Every story really has got that as an element. And for me, these social entrepreneurship stories, they all had that in common. Very often, very often big stories of, of failure and people trying something and then just giving it up because it wasn't working, but not giving up the pursuit. So from a human level, what I found very interesting is that these are people who face immense obstacles and refuse to give up, rather learn from the obstacles, see what the, uh, they could learn from the mistakes, start over again, sometimes in a completely different field, 
And from that, you can actually learn a lot. So I found the stories, each of them, you know, not just interesting from an entrepreneurship point of view, but from a human point of view, you know, they're, they're very inspire, inspiring. And especially in our society, <coughs> what also interested me, you know, aside from a few um, of the entrepreneurs, most of them I'd never heard of before. So they were new to me. And um, it struck me how many people in South Africa work under the radar and behind the scenes, like away from the bustle of everyday politics. And they're doing amazing things and they're creating jobs and they're creating wealth and they're making products. And you very rarely hear about them because they don't have the time to go out and blow their own trumpets. So a lot of it for me was exposing and exploring this kind of hidden almost section of our society that is very inspirational. And we have so many problems here. We have so many challenges to face. And then you see how many people are facing those challenges and solving those problems without a big spotlight on them. So that was a big part of the interest for me was telling stories that otherwise may have remained hidden. Wow, quite interesting. I mean, I only know from the second, from the second one, I, I really know about two. I know now, Kutiri and uh, the African Leadership Academy. And the rest of yeah. the guys, I didn't know them at all. And I was quite blown away by the impact that they're making. And, yes. and, and no one really, you know, yeah, I think for me, that, that was quite fascinating. Any story that stood out for, I'll tell you which story stood out for me, but any story that stood out for you. And I know obviously I'm asking you an unfair question because you are supposed to be, you know, diplomatic yeah. and say all of them, you know. Yeah. But which, which one really sort of stuck with you for a while? Um, yeah. Well, I must say, um, Nao, this guy who started this, uh, what he calls the ATM for medicine. He actually struck me as a, as a very interesting character. I had heard a little bit about his, um, about his story, Naya Hutiri. And what's interesting about his story is that he was working very successfully um, in a big mining company. And he could have gone very far. He could have quite easily gone to executive level. But he wanted to do something more. And he got frustrated in the formal company structure. And his own background story is that he had a chronic illness, he had tuberculosis, and he spent a lot of his time waiting in clinics to get his chronic medication. And using his engineering background and his IT and software knowledge, he came up with the idea, eventually, after much trying and failing with other ideas, to develop a technology that allows people not to sit and wait in a clinic, but to go in and with an SMS um, number that they get on their phone to open uh, a, ca a cabinet and to get their medication uh, almost instantly. So this is a story of somebody whose own personal circumstances, his own frustration with sitting in a clinic and waiting for his medication led him to develop this very interesting technology that's attracted a lot of interest around the world. So his motive was to make life easier for other people who had to sit in clinics waiting and waiting and waiting for their chronic medication. So that's where his social entrepreneurship comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but the first time he tried this was more commercial. He, he, um, he came up with a, a product um, that would allow you to go and pick up parcels from mm -hmm. big retail centers. And that didn't really work. But then he kind of put two and two together and, um, and the ATM for, for medicine was the big idea. But he's a, he's a young, dynamic entrepreneur with a lot of ideas. And he, he you know, I think entrepreneurship is, in essence, uh, a way of solving a problem. So there's a problem that needs to be solved. And as an entrepreneur, you figure out how to solve it. If it's a product or if it's a service, or in this case, it's a very personal problem that Neo faced, he got really, really frustrated with having to wait so long in a clinic. Um, and, he, and that was his problem. And the solution was not just a solution for him, but for people in clinics around South Africa and ultimately, hopefully, around the world. So that was one of my favorite stories. 
because of its personal nature and also because crucially because of his youth. So he's a young guy, a young entrepreneur. Young, young entrepreneurs are particularly interesting. They're often more idealistic, um, you know, and then you often think, well, you know, why not just stay in a corporation where you could get to executive level, make a lot of money, um, you know, have, get a big house, etc. Why leave that to start something risky on your own? So those stories are what really interest me. People who take big risks and have big ideals. And he's a, he's I, I a mean, prime example of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I know Neo personally. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, the clinic where he was doing his pilot in Mamidodi, that's, that's my hometown. And, yes. and I know the clinic as well. So I know the challenge. At some point, he was like, he's giving up. This thing's not going to work. And, but he yes. just said, yeah, and I'm quite happy to see that he, you know, his tenacity and, you know, is paying off. So, yeah. It's yeah. Kind of amazing story. Okay. Yeah. That's, let's talk about social entrepreneurs. So one of the questions that often comes from our students is, what is a social entrepreneur? Because there's this, you know, there's this uh, fine line between NGO work you know, people yes. want to do good and, and you know what, I want to give back. They often say, I want to give back and therefore I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm just going to run this thing and I'm going to charge people because people are poor, they don't have money. And, yeah. and, and what has been your understanding of, you know, it doesn't have to be so textbook, you know, but your understanding of what social entrepreneurs are and what are the key things that, you know, have been spoken to over, I would say, social entrepreneurs what are the things that are common as you try and you know uh, synthesize all this data yeah so i think um social entrepreneurs primarily are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are people who venture into business with an idea product or service that has a possibility of succeeding uh, they inherently are risk takers um so that's a big part of it um, you know, you can find entrepreneurs working in companies, but most often entrepreneurs are individuals who go off and start something on their own or in partnership. So that's the first part of it. They are risk takers. And then the social part of it is that the enterprise, whatever it might be, at some level has a social goal or a social mission. And that mission can be something very simple. Um, you know, it can be something very big and idealistic, such as let's make the world a better place in some way. But usually a social entrepreneur has got a very specific goal or understanding of what difference they want to make to the world. So in the case of Neo, who we've just been talking about, his social mission is let's make healthcare a bit easier from a process and systems point of view. And in that way, make South Africa a healthier place for people to live in. So there's always, at some level, an ideal. Uh, so social entrepreneurs are not starry-eyed people with a big dream. They kind of are, are practical people who have a social drive. And the social drive is what drives the entrepreneurship. But I think the reason it's difficult to define is what is more important, the social part of it or the entrepreneurship part of it. So my understanding is that they both kind of drive the other. So the social idea, whatever it might be, ultimately to make the world a better place, that is what drives the entrepreneurship and the risk taking. And then the entrepreneurship, once the entrepreneur starts succeeding and making some profit, that in turn feeds the social ideal again. So a social entrepreneur might be somebody whose goal is to create jobs. When the jobs are created, you're turning more social entrepreneurs out. And in turn, you're kind of helping to fulfill your own vision, which was to create jobs and opportunities. Um, but yeah, I've heard many different definitions, but to me, it's somebody who has an entrepreneurial drive and an entrepreneurial instinct, but has a social mission pushing them. So they want to succeed as entrepreneurs in order ultimately to make the world a better place, as opposed to a pure entrepreneur who simply wants to make profit. And of course, when profit comes, you will make the world a better place because you'll create jobs and, and you'll create products and so on. So you can make the world a better place by creating great products. 
Um, but the social entrepreneur always, I think, at the back of their mind, they're always thinking, how can my business help my social mission? So those two things, I think that's why you know, the word social pushes the word entrepreneur there. You're an entrepreneur because you have a social mission and you want to achieve that in some way. Um, and I think that's the big difference of straight profit-driven entrepreneurs don't necessarily have a big social imperative. Social entrepreneurs, by definition, do. Yeah. Any common commonalities that you've picked up from all these entrepreneurs that you have spoken to? Things yeah. that, you know, you could say, ah, now this is, you know, it's a passion that I'm picking up. Yeah. So I think one commonality, although it's probably a commonality among all entrepreneurs, is that they inherently will take big and often disproportionate risks um, in order to succeed. But social entrepreneurs in the South African context, I think what they have in common is very often a great sense of frustration at the problems that we face and at the fact that things aren't working. So social entrepreneurs inherently, I think you can actually say that they are restless and dissatisfied individuals. Their restlessness means that they are prepared to go out there and work very hard to change things. Um, they're restless and they're dissatisfied because of the system, because of the legacy of, of, uh, of political systems in South Africa, obviously. Um, so there's very often a sense of things are broken and we need to fix them and how can we fix them? So we all know that, we're all aware of it, but instead of simply complaining about the problems that we face, a social entrepreneur will look very practically at possible solutions. I think that's what they have in common. They are idealists in the sense of they hope for a better society, but they're also very hard workers in the sense that they figure out ways to bring this vision to life. So um, those that I've met and those that I interviewed in the book, I would say, I would say that's a very big thing they have in common. They're all very restless. They're not complacent at all. Even when their businesses succeed, they don't sit back and celebrate their triumphs. Rather, they kind of say, well, what next? And, and how can I do things better next time? Um, and they're often kind of, that becomes their all-consuming, you know, the word passion is very overused, but, you know, there's stories of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs in particular, whose their family lives fall apart because they spend so much time trying to achieve their mission. They're very self-driven um, individuals. They push themselves very hard, torture themselves almost. So I think that's what they have in common as individuals. They can often be very difficult and they'll often admit this to you. They're not easy people. They are mavericks. And mavericks is another good word. You know, we hear the word disruptors a lot, uh, but we also hear mavericks. So entre social entrepreneurs are Mavericks, they don't fit in easily into the corporate world, for instance. They don't fit in easily into definitions of what business people are. Um, but these are some of the characteristics they have in common. Uh, Self-driven, restless, dissatisfied, and hungry, very hungry, not just in the sense of wanting to kind of make money to put food on the table, but hungry for change. I think they're all driven by wanting to do something that changes even in a small way people's lives and subsequently changes the society they live in and i think in my perception they're also they're never really satisfied no matter how big the enterprise gets no matter how successful it is they'll always be thinking what lies beyond and what can i do better and how can i how can i change things more they're very hard on themselves i think those are some of the characteristics that they have in common Okay, thanks. I'm gonna just ask one last question and I'm going to open the platform for uh, sure. other guys to, to throw in. So, uh, Ndobu, uh, please get your question, <laughs> question ready. And Hector, also you are next, uh, get your questions ready. Um, guys, I mean, I read the book, I read both books, um, quite amazing stories. Um, there's, there's a, 
slight perception and, and you know you, you might correct it you might agree with it but a slight perception that you are likely to find more women being social yeah. entrepreneurs because they are more in tune with you know more concerned about the environment and what's happening yes. you know they're more social beings you know than yes. guys guys are busy trying to put in some so exchange deals and be deals and I yes. hear and the big thing. But women are likely to be the one who are more in tune with, you know, kids who don't have full uniform. Uh, you know, doctors, you, you know, the, the UK Medical Center, and I yes. love that story by uh, Dr. Uh, Darcy Ramukumato. Yes. Know, you know, I, I mean, is, is it far fetched to think that way that? women tend to be the ones who are more social entrepreneurs. I mean, in our program, we have more women than guys. Oh, that know. is interesting. That's you interesting. So, so, yeah. Is that been your perception that, or for you, it's a split? Or in, yeah. In the middle? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question, actually. You know, the original list of, of uh, possibilities, I think there was quite a, a heavy weighting, actually, in all of the lists that I saw towards women entrepreneurs. So I think there's a few reasons for that. But you know, the famous Chinese saying that women hold up half the sky, you know, that's an old saying, but it's very true. Um, and there's something about uh, female entrepreneurs and the ones that I spoke to, certainly, um, in many ways, things are changing now a bit, but historically, women have faced greater challenges in getting enterprises started and in getting ahead in business. So I think historically there have been greater obstacles in their way. And as a result of that, maybe greater resilience, greater determination. So many of the kind of role models of, of social entrepreneurship globally and in this country have been women who have really had to fight very hard to succeed and to get their enterprises working. But I think it's become very common. So you say that you've, you've got a lot of women who are students in your classes. You know, when I do work with journalists in academies, you know, Vitz, for instance, on the Journalism Honours Programme, um, the last time I worked with them a year ago, there were two guys in the class. The rest were women. And this is something that... that that has struck me over the years, more and more women are entering journalism, which in a way is a social field to begin with. And it's, you know, I'm not 100% sure of the reason, um, but you can definitely kind of analyze it and you can say women maybe have strong social awareness, um, have strong kind of uh, idealism. And you could also um, say, well, well, for me, that's actually a big part of it is that for so many years, for so many decades, women have struggled to start enterprises, have not been taken seriously as entrepreneurs, have been seen as outsiders and outliers. And um, it's got to the point where the balance is now being restored. And a lot of women have been given the opportunity and have been given greater support and funding. So that's one reason for it. It's There's, there's more support logistically, there's more support financially for women entrepreneurs than there has been in the past. So a lot of the obstacles have been kind of eased out of the way. And as a result, I wouldn't say, I don't think it's e easy for anybody to be an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur, but I think some of the big obstacles, just the obstacles of perception as in, I don't think it's at all unusual to see women in technology, women in media, women in healthcare, et cetera. It's not unusual to see them in the forefront. It's only when you ask yourself that question of why that you begin to analyze it. Otherwise, it's incredibly common. And I think in the same way, you know, you can say we have more women now in politics and in parliament in South Africa than in many years previously. It's, it's I think part of it is um, working towards a more egalitarian society where you simply take certain things for granted that anybody can have an opportunity. But definitely one of the things that interested me a lot was the, and of course it was a big object of the book was to be as diverse as possible. 
But the stories of women who very often come from incredibly difficult backgrounds and had been brought up by single parent domestic workers and had learned from their mothers how to endure and survive. Those are very South African stories. And, um, you know, the, the fact that, that more and more women are becoming social entrepreneurs, uh, it, I think it's just a question of balance, really. Balance is being restored. And, um, but, they, but still, if you look at the characteristics, I don't think there's terribly much difference there um, between men and women as entrepreneurs. They, they have the same drive, they face different obstacles, but at heart and at soul, they kind of are the same people with the same zeal and the same drive. Yeah. Can I just sneak in one question before uh, Andrew comes in? Do you think, do you think a society, uh, people who are in the entrepreneurship development space, banks, funders, everybody, do you think they recognize social entrepreneurs as serious entrepreneurs? Yeah. So I think more and more social entrepreneurship is being taken seriously as a field. And as a result, there are more and more opportunities. In fact, not just opportunities, but you get a number of companies, for instance, um, two that spring to mind straight away are South African breweries and, and, and Discovery, for instance, actively going out and looking for social entrepreneurs, looking for people with great business ideas that make a difference. So there's more kind of access to startup capital. There's more kind of, there's a lot of, uh, there, are, there are competitions, there are initiatives. So in some way, there's a greater awareness that people out there um, need to be incentivized and need to be, um, I think also, you know, we live in a, in a world where we, you know, competition in a reality TV sense. We're always looking for the next big thing. We're looking for the next big inventor. So it's almost a sense of that. Let's find the talent. Let's find the especially young people with great ideas and and unearth them and give them the means to make their ideas work. So yeah, I think social entrepreneurship is taken seriously. Um, there are more opportunities, but there's also more and more competition. Like Naya who Terry, who we were talking about, he won a big. Um, award he won a big prize that allowed him to start his business um, so you've got the opportunity if you if you have a good idea you can fairly easily find um, some way to put that idea to life uh, so where once upon a time people may have you know shown you the door when you came in with a with a social entrepreneurship idea now you're finding I think you're finding a good chance you won't have money thrown at you but you're finding a good chance that people will take you seriously. And also, I think there's great awareness of the need for people to fix our society. So if you have a great idea, but you don't have the capital to start it up, you probably will find someone who at some point will say, well, this sounds good. Let's let's see what you can do with it. And he has a business loan or, or he has an award or whatever. So yeah, I think social entrepreneurs are being taken seriously, but they also are having to work harder and harder to prove themselves because especially now with the pandemic, things are tighter, the economy is struggling, and you have to not just have a bright idea, you also have to have a way of bringing it to, it to life. So you have to, you have to yourself take yourself more seriously as a social entrepreneur. You won't simply have an award thrown your way um, without proving yourself. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Thanks, thanks, Pat. Uh, go. <laughs> Go for it, Mark. So, 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 my leader. Uh, uh, Mr. Silva, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Hey, thanks. I hope I'm, uh, you guys can see me here. Yeah, I'm in the vehicle. Yes. I'm in the booth somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My work, my work is just something else. Yeah, but um, thank you so much for the, for the, for the great presentation. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I just have to apologize. Um, I, 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 I couldn't get the books, so I haven't read the books, old books. Uh, but from what I get, um, it's 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 in line with what I do and what we do as as the Web Foundation and Safunda Donator Book. So uh, I, I've got two, three questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got three questions. So one, um, I've always heard about 
uh, what they call the principles of, 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 of business. And one of them was philosophical thinking. Um, yes. So now, as, as, as social entrepreneurs and working in rural areas, um, how do we build uh, 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 organizations that will last for years, a legacy yeah. type of organizations? Um, how, how do we uh, uh, build structures and systems? And, and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to learn from what you have gathered from uh, the, the guys that you've interviewed. How did they do it? Are these uh, uh, social initiatives still existing? How long have they been in the game? And, and by the look of things or by your discretion or projections, do you think these initiatives will last in the next 10 years? Will they be relevant in the next 10 years and so forth? Yeah, yeah. that's my first question. Okay. All right, so let, me, so let me quickly give some thoughts on that. I think um, it's important to be philosophical about whatever enterprise you're starting. In other words, thinking very hard about why you're doing it. And then of course, how you're going to do it. But the philosophy underlying it is very much why are you doing it? And I think if you have that in place, are you doing it in order to um, improve the lives of people in a certain community or are you doing it in order to, to create um, uh, businesses and opportunities for other people in turn? But from what I've seen, and I think particularly in rural areas with rural type initiatives, I think it begins with a very strong support structure. So you almost need um, a strong sponsor, a strong mentor, a strong backer to help you get started, to take some of the weight off your shoulders so that you don't have to take care of, of every little detail. But for instance, um, and I forget his name now, he was a guy that I interviewed for the first book. He um, started a community in uh, Bushbuck Ridge in Pumalanga, which is a very poor area, very impoverished. He started a community of beekeepers. So he went out and he taught people how to start keeping bees and how to make honey and very, very small scale. And uh, his support structure simply came from the fact that he himself knew how to do this and he was able to teach people and show them. And then the support structure beyond that came from having a market for this honey that he was making. So each little individual beekeeper or two working together were able to make this community eventually succeed. And as a result of that, he came out with a product that became very successful on the market. And you know, you can buy this honey now in supermarkets and in Duskem and so on. But he also started philosophically asking himself, why am I doing this? Uh, first of all, he's reason was really that he was fascinated in beekeeping in the ways that you can kind of make money from making honey, you know. Um, but his big philosophy was, what can he do as an individual to try and create work for impoverished people in, in a very poor rural area? And because beekeeping is not that difficult if you learn how to do it, that was his how of doing it. Um, but I think you need to before you start anything, you need to know that you can have somebody that you can rely on, whether it's to provide funding or whether it's to provide logistical support. For instance, you know, you might have a very successful rural enterprise, but if you have no way to distribute your products, whatever they might be, it's going to be very difficult to succeed. So philosophically, you can answer the question why, but the how would be what structures do you have in place to distribute a product, to take to market whatever you're doing. Um, yeah, so, so whether it's an organization that is supporting you, whether you kind of um, have borrowed money from somewhere in order to start, what structure do you have in place that, can I ask you what, what, what is your actual business? What is your rural enterprise that you're working on? Uh, just unmute, Baba. Unmute, unmute. <laughs> yeah. How did I mute? Who unmuted? Who muted me? Okay. 
So uh, what we do is uh, we basically establish or refurbish schools and uh, classrooms into libraries in rural oh, wow. schools. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's what we do. So we outsource books and uh, material that we use to do the bookshelves and everything. And then, yeah. And then we do our... Okay. our yeah, but well, that's a great one because then philosophically, what you're doing is you're encouraging people to read, yes. and uh, encouraging people to read means you're educating them and kind of, in some way, giving them a better start to the future. If you can read, you're a lot yes. better off than somebody who's not able to to read. So Absolutely. I think that your your big support structure there would would be first of all, you know, the actual physical work that you're doing in refurbishing and, and stocking libraries, but then also what you're doing, you're helping to create a culture of reading and you're helping to, to build a very important aspect of improving education in South Africa. So the support structures you have in place there, whether, whether it would be education departments, whether it would be commercial enterprises like, like bookshops and who you would be working with. So that would all be your kind of your support network, people who would support what you're doing, organizations who would support what you're doing, and government, very important that government also is in some way supporting what you're doing in one way or another. But what you're doing is very idealistic because you're working in a field that is very important to society at large, but at the same time, you know, you need to convince people that reading is just as important as as eating and surviving every day. So you have to have, I'm sure you've got a lot of work to do there in persuading people. But it sounds like a that sounds like a great business. I would just think, I would just think the, the more support structure you can have around you, the more, the more kind of uh, physical, logistical funding support you can have uh, to make that vision come true, the better. All right. Thanks. 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 Great one. Now, um, can we quickly shoot through your two questions? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just gonna shoot one. He has answered okay. the other one uh, that I had prepared. Okay. So I have one. So I'm interested again through your the interviews that we've had on your first and the second book. Um, whether uh, I hear that. Okay. He just vanished just when, as he was about to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, you might want to come back to it. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, it's fine. We'll, 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 we'll take his question when he comes back. Uh, yeah. Hector? Mr. Makato? Oh, he's back. Are you back? Are you back? Okay, go, oh, for, okay. It. go for it. Go for it. Okay. Go. Um, yes, 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 I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hear awesome. So yeah, I wanted to find out. Um, see, uh, I'm I'm still battling with 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 being employed and running this 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 initiative. Um, how did these other guys do it? How did they? How was it? How was the experience for them leaving their corporate or their professional work? And then focusing on this initiative, how 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 have they adjusted yeah. or, or or made it? You know, yeah. Okay, so let me answer that quickly and broadly because everyone's stories are different. But um, I would think the common thing is that people need to have some kind of safety net. So, in other words, um, uh, to just go out without any resources is very risky. Um, so often what happens is that somebody will go to a, an incubator, a startup organization that will give you a certain loan or some sort of um, uh, you know, incentive to go ahead and bring your, your service or your idea to life. Otherwise you have to, to go and seek funds entirely on your own and that can take so much of your time in fact, I think it's the biggest challenge that people face initially is how to get the funding to make their dreams come true. So my kind of, and this is just based on people I've spoken to, 
Um, before taking that big leap from the corporate sector, what you would do is what is explore the possibilities of getting your idea funded and making it viable. So before you take that take that big walk out of the door, you would look at who else is doing that kind of work in your field, how competitive is it, whether you can maybe work with them. But ultimately, your big challenge is what big organization, whether it's a social organization or, or perhaps it's government, whoever it is, a corporation, how can you kind of find the resources that you need to put that ideal to life? Because if you go out into the world without any resources, it will be a huge struggle. And of course, you'll have to rely on luck to a certain extent. You also have to rely on networking. I think to answer your question finally, just in quick, I think you'll find, generally speaking, that successful entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs in particular, are very keen to help. So let's say you found somebody else who's been, who's been working in the education sector through networking, uh, whether it's formally uh, at an event uh, after the pandemic, hopefully, or whether it's informally on, on social media, a lot of people are more than happy to share their own experiences and advice. So I would advise you on to consult to spend some time on social media, find other people who are doing what you're doing and get in touch with them and see what they can teach you just by sharing their experiences. Uh, you'll find that they often are more than happy to tell you what they've learned and to tell you what not to do as well as what you could do. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I hope you are, you are sorted. Uh, can we quickly go to Hector? Hector? Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for the good presentation and uh, sharing some of the ideas, very interesting ones, of course. I just want to uh, bring to you at least just three concepts uh, associated with the uh, social entrepreneurs. And I think when in your opening, you spoke about something uh, very close to me called uh, grassroots uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a program in the organization that I'm working for, which is called grassroots innovation. So uh, one of the things that I've been observing in the space is uh, Sustainability, I think, is the term that I just want to bring to your attention. Sustainability, scalability, and the barriers social entrepreneurs are really operate. And how do, if there are no specific barriers, how do you then create barriers? Because you, if depending on your and uh, on your intention when you 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 you, you open a startup or a, a, an entity uh, to address a specific uh, a, a need, whether the need is social or is economic. It now yes. uh, 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 to say, am I uh, bringing a solution that is going to be scalable, scalable, sustainable, or it's only localized? Uh, yes. for, for example, your COVID problems. Normally, people currently you might be seeing that the registration at the CPICF increased because people want to distribute uh, 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 PPEs and so. But yes. can they go beyond COVID? Uh, yeah. That is one of the things that I just wanted to bring in the in the space in the, in the discussion of so, social entrepreneurs. Do we think about those things when we open the market? Do I come with a solution that only address the current problem, uh, and when the problem is addressed, uh, depending on the market share, then what do I do? So then it means you have to have a social entrepreneur who perhaps come with several solutions. You have a company that. Uh, uh, because that is just one of the observation that I've been uh, 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 that just passed to say. Perhaps we have to be clear when we start startups. Is it for profit making, so, so economic yeah. benefit, or to address just a social problem? When it's done, I can close it, or I can do that for profit but evolve. I think that is what I just wanted to share with the with the okay. panel. And I just want to have here also your, your, your view on that to say sustainability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and scalability also, uh, in view of localized uh, kind of solutions in, 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 in social entrepreneurship space. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Hector. That's you very uh, eloquently summed up one of the big challenges that any social entrepreneur faces, which is 
the idea might be a good one, but it might actually also be a very small and local one. And the challenge and the word you use, scalability, is very important, uh, and sustainability also. So it might be a fantastic idea, but if it can't sustain into the future, it's not going to be a lasting business. And you did mention the pandemic and PPEs and so on. And I think this pandemic, you can, you know, it's a terrible pandemic, but one of the positive things about it is that it's forcing people to think very differently and to come up with very different solutions. So if as a social entrepreneur, you can do something that is of service and of use now to us, but can also be beyond the pandemic. And I think a lot of, you know, talking about characteristics, uh, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs also tend to be very visionary. So they don't just look at what's in front of them and what's happening at the moment. They look beyond, they look five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line. So I think the idea that you might have, whatever it might be, the big question that you have to ask yourself, as you've told us, is how can you take it from local to global? And how can you take it from now into the future? If you can't easily answer those questions, then you might have something that will have a very short-lived success. Um, but if you can say, this has got lasting potential and it's something that, and I think you also used a very important word, which is evolve. You, you, you have something that is dynamic. It's not just a solution for a problem today. It's a solution that can be reworked and refashioned and reinvented into the future. So and the cause I was also saying, you know, philosophically, these are the things you would ask yourself. Um, your startup idea, it might be great as a startup, but how good is it as something that can continue and can continue to grow? Uh, so, you know, that's why I think networking is such a good idea because it's not just you asking these questions, but you're asking other people and you're asking for their criticism too. So they might say to you, you know, this is a great idea for today in the pandemic that we're in, but what's the point of it in five or 10 years from now? So yeah, I think social entrepreneurs need to ask themselves these questions very self-critically and then i think they need to run them by people and uh get prepared to have them their ideas shut down because they're not sustainable but any idea that you have these are the things you need to say will they work into the future as well as the next yeah. few days uh, and i think also guys in the disruptors one uh where you did a story for corvin naidu um there's, I mean, in that chapter, I think the main thing that stands out is how franchising reimagines social enterprise. And I think for me, that stood out as how do you actually franchise a social enterprise, which is how do you take it and scale it beyond. So you can actually, you know, convert yeah. a social enterprise into a franchise. And I found that to be quite interesting. And this was in the, in the first book yeah. as well. But thanks for that. Uh, any other questions from the other colleagues? We need to wrap up with us. Any other questions? Majaji, any question? Are you good? Are you covered? Do you want to throw in something? No, I honestly don't have any questions. Some of my questions were answered by Gus himself and um, some of the guys, especially on sustainability and just to make a comment, I, I, I think uh, he actually clarified what social what a social entrepreneur is for me when he said it depends. The main thing is what drives you. Are you driven by making a social impact or profit? Mm -hmm. So it was a very insightful session, I must say. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Hello, Kazi. Hello, Kazi. You're going to have to unmute yourself. You're going to have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, I did. I think I did it successfully this time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening. Um, most of my questions are because, uh, well, this group is amazing, first of all. The questions you guys ask is everything I was wondering about. And thank you to Gus for answering all those questions. Yeah. 
And when we're talking about women being more prone to take up on social enterprises, and um, Gus specified that maybe it's the system equalizing itself and everything. And I think it's quite interesting because even in all organizations like that are social, for example, church or whatever, you'll find mostly women than men. So I actually made the observation that especially with um, social enterprises, after re uh, reading what, um, what's her name? Uh, Sarah, Sarah Jeet mm -hmm. said yeah. that social entrepreneurs are disruptors of a kind, big time dreamers. They like stories woven into their dreams. I think for us as women, it is easier for us to face our, our issues and be spoken, outspoken about them. And that's why we are then able to openly find solutions where with male they might more be more goal driven to find their money to buy their dream cars and things like that in not unless they have something that they are personally being affected by as in the case of male and what i wanted now to know is uh in the beginning um doc uh commented about your style of writing i'm an english teacher by profession and okay. what i've found is that i'm more of a speaker than a writer and you spoke about finding or maybe coming up with a blueprint where yeah. you know where the story begins and how it ends in the middle and everything. But what I found for me personally is that the moment I put pen to paper, it doesn't come out anything like how I, env I envisioned. You know, it yeah. just takes a life of its own. And I wanted to know what can I do to structure my writing? Because the blueprint will be there. But the moment yeah. I put pen to paper, my thoughts go in their own direction that is not in any way, shape or form, but it's also something that has to be said. It's just not what I had in mind when I put pen to paper. So how can I then um, write in a way that is directed? Because at the end of the day, being a speaker is not always possible. Sometimes you need to put it in writing. So how then do I put it in a way that I would be as effective in its being written as well as it would be if it was um, spoken? Yeah, well, that's a good question, Pelikazi. And I think, um, I think all social entrepreneurs have got stories to tell. So I think the key word there is telling a story. Um, in the writing workshops that I've done, I've found this exact problem where people say they've got stories in their head, they can kind of speak them, but when it comes to this putting pen to paper or putting your fingers to a keyboard, um, you get stuck. Uh, and I've often found that a way to address that is not to begin by thinking that you're writing something, but rather to begin by telling a story. So if you sit down to write something, it's often you have a barrier and the barrier is the machine that you're using or the barrier is the paper and the pen. But if you sit next to somebody at an event or if you meet a friend who you haven't met for a long time and they say to you, what's going on in your life? Tell me what you've been doing. You don't say to them, give me a second, let me think about this, I'll get back to you. You tell them the story. So storytelling is very instinctive. And I think if you want to write those stories, you first need to tell them. Uh, and this is, it's age old advice, but I think it works very well. Um, don't think of what you're doing as being a writing exercise, think of it as being a telling exercise. And instead of saying, I've got something that I need to write and getting stuck at that point, say, let me put this in an email to my best friend or to someone in your family. And then you won't be thinking that you're writing. You're simply telling them a story. So whatever you need to write, you start off by telling it as if you're saying it to somebody who you know, and then, and then you've got something that's actually going to take shape. So let's use, for example, a story of starting a business. If someone said to you, write your story so that we can all see how you did it, you might hesitate, you might get stuck, you might find it very difficult. But if somebody said, share your experience with us, share what you've learned and tell us how it happened, you'll just sit in front of a computer and you'll type out that email and it might take you half an hour, 20 minutes, and you'll have a few hundred words. That's because you're not thinking of writing it, you're simply telling it. So every time you need, and eventually it'll be instinctive and there won't be any difference between the two. But to begin with, instead of facing this big barrier and this big challenge of having to write something, simply 
tell it to somebody. And I actually mean, you know, physically do tell it. Uh, send an email to somebody and tell them what the story is and then see how they react to it and see what questions they ask you. Um, I often find you know, a lot of what I do for work is, is editing. So I often get a piece of writing and it simply doesn't work because it's too formal, it's too stilted, there's not enough information. And then I'll say, instead of rewriting it, I'll say to the writer, just answer a few questions for me. Um, how did you do this? Why did you do this? Tell me more about this and that. And then they give me the answers in an email and I take their answers and I turn that into their story and I give it back to them. And I say, here's your story. It's been written in your own words. And then of course you need to do more work on it. It's just the beginning, not the end. But very often that is a way to break this big barrier, not to see it as a piece of writing that you need to do, but rather see it as a piece of storytelling. And especially in your case, you say you're comfortable with speaking. Uh, and if you're a teacher, a lot of what you do is speaking. And also, I think the key definition of writing is trying to make sense of a chaotic world. So as a teacher, you make sense of chaotic and difficult to understand principles. If you can take that same way of thinking and turn it into words on a page, you are writing, but you're not doing something you know, that you think of as writing. You're simply telling a story and, and making sense of chaos. That often works very well. Okay, another follow-up question. Mm, sure. Yeah, thank you so much. That really makes sense. And another question is that with the with the with the notion that there are more females than males, and I believe that we both have something to bring to the table because we have two different diverse perspectives and different problems. Obviously, we can only offer different solutions as the different genders. Yeah. How then do we encourage, especially in my case, when I'm in contact with the boys, for example, in my class, because you'll find on all activities on all whatever that we're doing that requires any form of socialization is the girls that are usually in the forefront. How then yeah. do I encourage boys or males in the broader sense to also bring the, whatever it is that they're feeling, whatever solutions that they have to the table? <laughs> yeah. so, so that's obviously quite a big challenge that goes to the, to the heart of, of, um, of education in a mixed gender school. Um, which is a, one of the reasons why a lot of a lot of people prefer sending their children to single gender schools because they don't you don't have that those I issues and those single challenges. Gender school. <laughs> no. I went to a single gender school, but I found that it doesn't you know it, it, it's not the all round solution to yeah. the problem. So let's no. say in a code no. school, how then do I balance it out? Yeah, I think I think to get back to what you were talking about earlier, I think one of the ways of doing it is to encourage children in a school to write as much as possible because writing is, it's kind of putting your emotions and your thoughts on paper without the pressure of having to open up in a class of children around you. I think one of the things that's very scary when you're in a class of any kind is standing up and speaking and having to face that big social pressure. Um, but if you say, um, yes, something to think about and I want to hit to, I want you to put your thoughts on paper and then let's share them. That can often work a lot better than, than uh, so I'm getting back to the power of writing, which writing is an introspective act. It forces you to think, it forces you to ask yourself questions, but it's also a communal act in the sense that you want people to hear what you've written. And I think in my experience, I've also done some work with school children where you try and encourage thinking and writing as an activity. You often find the quietest, the shyest, the most awkward children in the, in the class are the ones who have the deepest ideas. And when they have the opportunity to share their writing, even if it's the teacher actually taking that writing and sharing it, those barriers kind of tend to fall. But I think what you're asking is an age old question that will never easily be, be solved because it's a social question as well as an education question. But certainly in my experience, you know, it might be something as simple as, uh, as, as he has a challenge for you. Let's let's write a song together, and um, get some music, and uh, and put some words to this beat or this rhythm. You often find that that kind of cuts the uh, barrier of um, of formal uh, thinking and, and makes it look. I'm not a teacher, but I have done a fair bit of the workshopping, I and I often find that, yeah, writing unlocks emotions, and it also kind of makes barriers fall away. 
But I, my daughter's a teacher, my father was a teacher, so I admire teachers very much because they have to figure out solutions to these challenges. But my solution would be use writing as a tool to cross these barriers and to um, unlock emotions and talent, of course. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for looking at Any other questions, you... uh, Lolo? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Gus. Thank you, Rosh. Um, Mr. Silva, you speak about social entrepreneurs being visionary mavericks, um, big dreamers, audacious yeah. doers. What would you, what would be your advice around self-care in the instance of burnout, pushing yourself, yeah. um, you know, really to the edges of cliffs and just being running rampant your, yeah. your ambition and compromising your mental and physical health in the process. What are your, what have you seen being healthy habits to, to, to cultivate or just tips for, for self-care? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's especially a good thing to think about uh, in these unusual times that we live in where we don't even have the kind of opportunity to meet other people and to network with them and to go to big events and to let off steam that way. But I can just, I can pass on really some things I've learned from interviewing entrepreneurs. So I've worked as a freelancer for many years and I kind of work in my own environment. But one thing that people say over and over again is that you need to look after yourself physically. So self-care is a mental and physical thing, but so many entrepreneurs that I've spoken to, I've actually asked them this question and they tend to say, you need to keep fit. You don't need to play sports. You don't need to be a radical marathon runner or anything, but so many of them say the same thing. And they say, at some point in your day, you have to just get out of your environment, whether it's your home or an office, and you have to go for a long and leisurely walk. And uh, you find that walking Scientifically, it's been proved to kind of open your mind just so it lets you think a lot, but it also kind of obviously is a physical exercise activity. So many of them, not just, they don't just say that, they'll actually use it as a way of solving problems. So instead of saying, let's sit down together around the table and try and fix this problem, they'll say, let's go for a walk. Let's grab a coffee and let's go walking together and let's, let's walk and talk. That, that is a big thing. Um, secondly, I would say we've got the benefit of technology making um, other people and their thoughts and worlds accessible to us. So if you are an active social media user, use the tools at your disposal to connect with people, to ask questions. So Twitter is seen by a lot of people to be very toxic and very kind of um, a noisy uh, environment, but at the same time, if you find the right people to talk to on social media who have exactly these issues in their mind, you'll find, first of all, they'll be very happy to, to chat, I mean, openly on Twitter, but secondly, they'll very often have suggestions that work. So self-care is the big one. I think one thing I've come to see on social media a lot during the pandemic is self-care being baking bread. So take time away from your problems um, get into the kitchen or wherever you want to do this and, and bake some bread. It seems to be a pandemic solution to, to the problem uh, that you're talking about. Um, you know, it's hard to say to entrepreneurial people, find yourself a hobby. That's, like, you know, that's not going to happen because for entrepreneurial people, their work is their hobby. Their work is their passion. So you can't solve the problem that way. But you can say, find something to do that occupies you, but also takes your mind off the immediate challenge that you're facing. And then I think, and this also is a piece of advice that everyone says, find some time to get enough sleep. That's not easy, but if you're able to get a good night's sleep, or if you're able to nap at some point during the day, I think that makes a big difference when it comes to caring for yourself and looking after yourself. So the idea and it's a bit of a 
romanticized idea that entrepreneurs never sleep, that they kind of get up at three in the morning to work and, and they're forever tired. That's not good, obviously. Um, people who do manage to make a success, you'll very often find that they have good, strong habits. They do get sleep, not necessarily eight hours. They do get some form of exercise. Even a walk around the block is exercise. Um, but I would say, reach out to people. Don't be afraid to get in touch with people you've never spoken to before online. The, the vast majority of people are only too happy to share what they've learned and to share what they know. I know I've come across several entrepreneurs. I've never met them, but I see what they do on Twitter where they actually will, will tweet in a row, several tweets where they actually are exactly answering this question. So if you go onto Twitter, if you're not an active user, if you join and you search, you'll find a lot of entrepreneurial people. I'm talking about South African entrepreneurs who address these issues. And the nice thing is you can talk back to them and you can say who you are and what you're doing. And in that way, you develop relationships with people who are facing the same issues and are coming up with answers to them. If you were to ask the very question you just asked on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, for instance, you'll get a wealth of very useful practical information from people who are in the exact same position as you. So I would say to sum up, you know, be active as you can, get sleep, eat properly if you possibly can, that's also important, but use the power of technology and social networks to discuss problems and to find solutions together. I think you find it can make a huge difference. Thank you. Um, Sabata, last one. Are you okay? Any questions, comments? Are you fine, Sabata? No question from my side. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. We have run out of time. And guys, thank you so much for this. You have sure. done an amazing work. And uh, keep up the good work, man. I. We are three minutes over time, so I apologize for that. But what an insightful session, and uh, you know this is quite important. And um, yeah, and uh, keep up the amazing work. Any new book coming? Disruptor three, <laughs> four? Yeah, no, I've, I've, yeah. Well, I've been doing. I've, I've been. I've, I've got a couple of books coming up. Uh, biographies on entrepreneurs. So it's a special interest of mine. Um, I admire anybody who's brave enough to do it to begin with, but I think, um, you know, never lose sight of the fact that what you're doing uh, is important and you're not just doing it for yourself, obviously. I think it's very important um, to kind of pursue your vision, no matter how hard it might be, and to know that there are lots and lots of people who in one way or another, even if they don't know it, are depending on you to bring those ideas to, to life. So it's a lot of pressure, but I, you know, I've spoken to a lot of social entrepreneurs, I've uh, read a lot of their stories, and I think those who push themselves very hard, they ultimately, they might, it may not seem like it at the time, but they ultimately do make a, a huge difference and they do improve the quality of life of a lot of people. So I would say, uh, yeah, please, please push yourselves and persevere. It's very important. <laughs> Uh, thanks thank a lot. you. On behalf of, of the team here, I mean, the work that you do, I've learned so much from this session. Uh, I've learned so much from the book. And thank you so much. And wish you all the best. Thank you, Rush. You too. Okay. All the best, everyone. Thank you for your thank you. time. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And thanks for your presence. And good night. Good night, everyone. Right. Good night. Bye bye.